Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel on gender-based violence and disability. My name is Eureka Last from Handicap International. I have the great pleasure to facilitate together uh, with Arlene our um, event, which is trying to engage all of us towards inclusion of gender and disability equality within Beijing Plus 20. And we are trying to do that by using good practice, which have been collected in 11 countries on gender-based violence and disability among women and girls with disability. Um, as most of you may be aware, there are more than 500 million women and girls with disabilities living today uh, in this world. They are more frequently exposed to gender-based violence than their peers without disability is what first evidence is really showing us. Um, we are very happy to be here today with you and I would like to use the opportunity before we hear um, the keynote from Catalina, uh, the special representative on human rights of persons with disabilities, to give us our, her note to introduce you to our uh, panel from around the world. I would like to start on the left hand side. We are very happy to welcome Natalia Rodriguez. Uh, I'm sorry, Priscilla Rodriguez from Disability Rights International, Central American office, um, who is here together with Natalia Santos, who is working with the Col Colectivo Chucan, an organization of representing people with psychosocial disabilities. And she is the one who initiated um, the group of women with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, in that group. She will tell us more about what they have been doing together with DRI in order to raise the voices and also do some research on gender-based violence and disability in Mexico. Next to her, we have Milanoi Koyet from Kenya, who is currently studying at the Syracuse University, who is going to share with us the good practice um, developed together with the Kenyan Association of the Intellectually Handicapped to improve the uh, gender-based violence response system in Kenya to become more inclusive of people with disabilities. It's my great pleasure to also welcome Stephanie Otto Lever uh, from Women Enabled International on our panel, who will uh, start and share with us latest evidence uh, on the situation of women and girls with disabilities in relation to violence, but also she will share with us some findings from uh, a review of reports uh, done uh, to the Beijing, uh, to the CSW this time. And next to be my co-moderator and great <laughs> co-facilitator, Arlene Kanter from Syracuse University. And on behalf of those three organizations, I really would like to welcome all of you together on my right hand side with Yong. Um, Shimli from UN Women, who will also respond at the end and share with us what UN Women is doing currently to engage women with disabilities uh, in their work and maybe also have some uh, sharing with us on how they are planning to work in the future on this topic. Also, I would like to make a little announcement um, shared with us from our sign language interpretation here, that because we are having a video here and we are trying to tape the event to stream it afterwards online um, so that people from the good practices around the world can hear your questions, can hear the presentations here, that we try to limit the movement inside the room in front of the cameras. And we speak slow enough so that she can do the translation, interpretation, okay? And to thank her for being here today and to recognize that we believe it's one of the first, or if not the first time, at a CSW meeting there has been a sign language interpreter. So we're very happy. <laughs> and we hope it's the beginning of a trend. Exactly. That any, that we will not be the exception, yes. but this will be the rule. <laughs> Good. 
Good afternoon, my name is Catalina de Mandas and I am the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I have been just appointed by the Human Rights Council to undertake this mandate that promotes and monitors the rights of persons with disabilities. I am honored to be here with you and excited to join you at this side event on the Commission of, uh, on the Status of Women, even if only by video. As all you know, this session of the Commission focuses on the Beijing Declaration and the Beijing Plus 20 review process. In other words, it focuses on how are we doing in advancing the rights of all women, including women and girls with disabilities. I would like to remind you that the groundbreaking Beijing Declaration already included the recognition of the rights of women and girls with disabilities. There are at least half a billion women and girls with disabilities in the world. It represents more than 15% of the global population of women. They face multiple human rights violations on a daily basis. One of the primary issues confronting women and girls with disabilities is the high levels of disability-based and gender-based violence experience, experience even at higher rates than the, than the one experienced by women in general. The intersection both of gender and disability stereotypes contributes to this. But they are also more likely to be poor, to be deprived of all basic services such as food, water and sanitation, health, rehabilitation or education, even more than men and boys with disabilities. As a woman with a disability from the development, developing world, one of my big concerns is to address the needs of women and girls with disabilities. This will be reinforced by my mandate that has a clear request to integrate the gender perspective through all my work. As you will read in my first report that is going to be presented at the 28th session of the Human Rights Council and, and on March 11, gender sensitive will be one of the overarching consideration of my activities. In my view, international and national efforts on disability have failed to systematically take into account a gender perspective. Because of that, I will consider in the first instance the multiple discrimination, marginalization and human rights violations that women and girls with disabilities face in most of our societies. Today, at this very important event, you will learn about some exciting practices addressing violence against, against women and girls with disabilities. Some as programs for women with disabilities specifically and others which integrate women with disabilities into other gender anti-violence programs. They all tell us that we can successfully address the violence experienced by women and girls with disabilities so long as we put our minds to, to the task. Please join us in this effort. I hope you have a successful event and I look forward to learning more about all the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Powerful introduction for all of us. Um, I'm going to try to leave that here in the background. But it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Stephanie Otto-Lever to start this uh, panel with sharing with us um, the evidence on gender-based violence, how it, is, how it is affecting women and girls with disabilities and its relation to Beijing Plus 20. Stephanie. Oh, yes, um, good. Let's see. What time is it? Can everybody tell me? I, it's, hard to, it's hard to know. Um, it's been quite a week. Welcome to our side event. Um, it was really an honor to co-sponsor this with my colleagues. And I'm so glad that all of you are here and thank you for your support um, in our work. This morning, I was asked to speak at an intergenerational dialogue organized by UN Women. And it was a very exciting event because intersectionality was a key point within um, the event. There was some attention to women and girls with disabilities, or at least some mention of it. but. Um, I was asked to speak, you know, basically about women and girls with disabilities. Um, and I do want to make one point that's very important to me. Um, as my feminist foremothers have told me over the years that we can only speak for ourselves 
and we can't really ever speak for other women. It's a very, very important, important point to me. So what I'm reflecting is the, the ideas and words of other women, of women with disabilities who have shared with me their experiences personally or about which I have learned through my research. Violence against women with disabilities is extremely pervasive. Um, as a matter of fact, women and girls with disabilities not only experience the same forms of violence that all women experience, but we experience various forms that are unique to us and have unique causes and have unique consequences. For example, women with disabilities are often subjected to forced non-consensual sterilization or forced institutionalization at higher rates than women in general. I mean, most other women are not forcibly sterilized, to be sure. Um, in, ad in addition, people who are our alleged care support often use that position in that role to has, uh, use it as a, what we could fondly call a patriarchal mechanism of control over us as women. And that's another very important point to make and to consider as we look into these issues. Um, of course, women with disabilities experience gender-based violence anywhere from two to four times as often as women in general. The problem with that range of numbers is that most countries don't collect gender-specific disability desegregated data on violence against women. So many cases we don't know, really, the incidence and frequency of violence against women. Furthermore, um, the differing definitions used in different countries and how they measure disability. In some countries where you know the incidence of disability is extremely high, just from our work, um, they report only one to two percent of the population as being people with disabilities. So um, all of these factors are very important. I wanted to just stress a couple of things that relate to the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Um, under the requirements that countries were given to do reporting on violence on women with this on women in general and the Beijing plus 20 process they were asked to report on some 12 categories um, many of these are very very interesting and governments in our review which I'll discuss in a moment um, didn't necessarily do the best job on all the 12 factors but when it came to women with disabilities they were very, very rarely doing anything much at all. There are, some, there are some factors here that were very unique and interesting to me with respect to women and girls with disabilities. Women in the media, for example, was an important factor to be discussed. As we all know, images of women and girls with disabilities, or at least positive ones, are are sparse, if at all, seen in media and publications. Indeed, many people who talk about leading women um, who have done a lot for women around the world, women with disabilities are not mentioned in those discussions. This is why Women Enabled introduced our WWD Shiro project, which you can follow on Twitter and Facebook, and I encourage you to do so, and anyone who wants us to consider including her in our series, please do. Um, the other factor which was very interesting to me in terms of women and girls with disabilities were the um, issue of women and the environment. As we all know, women and girls with disabilities are more often subjected to the ravages of climate change and natural disasters, but yet these issues, first of all, sparsely discussed generally, were basically never discussed with respect to women with disabilities. So we, because we sort of had a suspicion of what might have gone on in the country reports, with my colleagues from Syracuse University, we did a review of just a small number of country reports as our time permitted. But we looked mostly at countries that were some of the practices that we had worked on um, to see as some of the good practices on ending violence against women. And we also looked at countries from a wide range of uh, regional areas and also diversity in terms of levels of so-called development. Um, and also considered whether the countries had ratified CEDAW and the CRPD. 
And I'm sure none of you will be shocked to learn that basically none of the reports really discussed women and girls with disabilities in a meaningful way. Occasionally there were references to people with disabilities, forgetting the fact that this was Beijing plus 20, which was supposed to be about women. Um, uh, and then whenever they did mention people with disabilities, they were more talking about protection and service provision rather than the human rights dimensions that were so crucial in the 12 categories of discussion outlined in um, Beijing plus 20. If you look at the handouts that we've given to you, and anyone who wants them electronically, please come and see me or Arlene, and we'll give you our cards, and um, or you can give us yours, and we'll be pleased to uh, send all the materials to you electronically. But that document, um, this, you know, enumerates each country that we reviewed and what we found with the quotes that we identified um, that were discussing women with disabilities or even people with disabilities. And then we also indicated our analysis, highlighting very briefly some of the issues that we know that should have been highlighted with respect to those countries and which were. Um, which were omitted. Um, so, you know, this reporting gap has, is really rather pervasive, I have learned. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a review of country reports that were issued um, under UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. Governments are supposed to do national action plans on this issue. and. You will not be surprised to learn that um, the results of that review were about as dismal or maybe more so than this review, because what we found when we did that review was that most gov governments never even addressed women and girls with disabilities in their, um, in their reviews. So if any of you are interested in reviewing the country reports uh, on Beijing Plus 20 from your country, if we haven't reviewed it as of yet, please see us and we'd be pleased to um, include it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, um, I'll be translating for Natalia, who will be speaking in Spanish, and then I'll also give a brief overview of the report that you have in front of you. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Natalia Santos. Trabajo en una organización colectivo Chucal. Soy directora para el programa de mujeres. Esta organización es gobernada y dirigida por personas con una discapacidad psicosocial. Uh, I'm here to represent the Colectivo Chucan, the only organization in Mexico run by persons with psychosocial disabilities. I'm in charge of the women's program at the Colectivo. Yo te lo Yo te lo en el Colectivo Chucan nos basamos en el fortalecimiento y empoderamiento por medio de un sistema de apoyo entre pares, el cual consiste en que personas con discapacidad psicosocial que tienen experiencia sobre, sobre la discapacidad ayudan a otras que van empezando con la discapacidad a, a aceptar la discapacidad. At the Colectivo we work uh, with peer support. We, uh, the peer support is based on the idea that persons with disabilities are able to um, help better, uh, are able to understand better the disability and uh, help others that are just starting with the disability. <coughs> to uh, deal with it and also to learn from each other on how to work with a disability. Tener un alto control, evi evitar crisis y ternamientos, y eso, eso nos ha ayudado mucho. Uh, we also uh, uh, help us each other avoid being institutionalized in psychiatric institutions, and uh, this has helped a lot to us. Ha sido importante la creación del grupo de mujeres porque al principio éramos pocas mujeres y, y las cuales no, no teníamos una participación activa en el colectivo Chucán y a partir de que por eso fue la necesidad de crear el grupo de mujeres el cual, el cual este, 
em, empezamos a, a tratar temas más íntimos y vivencias de experiencias de mujeres con discapacidad y también ser portavoces de, de mujeres que están en segregación. So, uh, with, uh, is, within the colectivo, we noticed the need to create a women's group because we were very few and we didn't have a clear participation, we didn't have leadership roles and we were not so involved in decision making. So we created our own uh, group where we could discuss issues that are sensitive to women, where we could also empower each other, and uh, where we could also become the spokespersons uh, for women with psychosocial disabilities in Mexico. Empoderarnos, aprender sobre nuestros derechos, reconocernos como sujetos de derechos. También teníamos un programa de radio donde hablábamos sobre la sobre las diferentes discapacidades en los diversos ámbitos de la vida, lo cual fue muy bueno porque sensibilizábamos a las personas y teníamos participación, voz representando a las mujeres con discapacidad psicosocial en México. Um, at the colectivo we've also learned about our rights, we have also empowered each other through learning about what rights we as women with disabilities have. And also, uh, we also have a radio program where we uh, sensitize uh, society on issues uh, relating to disability. But it's also very important because we found each other to be representatives of women and we found each other to have a voice. Los elementos más importantes que consideramos que, que ha tenido el Comité de Mujeres ha sido la, la el liderazgo por parte mía para dirigir a las mujeres con discapacidad, el liderazgo de las mujeres a partir de, sus, de nuestras experiencias para compartir eh, la constancia, el respeto hacia nosotras, eh, el, el apoyo fundamental de Disability Rights International que nos ayudó a, a consolidarnos como organización, constituirnos Eso fue un apoyo muy grande, el apoyo técnico que nos brindó, nos han estado brindando y en, en un ejemplo. So, um, the key issues that have helped us uh, become a, an empowered women's group is first of all the leadership, my leadership, but also the leadership of every woman at the Colectivo based on each of her ex and, and their experiences as well as uh, the mutual consent, respect, and, um, uh, and respect for each other and for each of our views and experiences. Another uh, fundamental factor was the support that Disability Rights International provided to the Colectivo so that we could uh, establish ourselves as an organization in Mexico, but also uh, provide us with the technical support and the tools that we uh, needed to become an, uh, an independent organization. Es, 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 logramos trabajar en conjunto las dos organizaciones, Disability Rights International, diseñando proyectos y ahora nosotras como mujeres con discapacidad psicosocial somos capaces de implementar proyectos como en el caso del del informe que hicimos sobre abuso y negación de los derechos reproductivos de las mujeres con discapacidad psicosocial, donde las mujeres del colectivo Chucán nos encargamos de aplicar encuestas a mujeres que son usuarias en instituciones psiquiátricas, y lo cual fue muy bueno porque al entrevistar a las mujeres ellas se podían abrir con nosotras por porque nosotros teníamos la vivencia y se identificaban con nosotros. Uh, we are now collaborating in projects with BRI. One, of, one good example is uh, the research into the violations of the sexual and reproductive rights of women with disabilities in Mexico, which is uh, this research. Uh, BRI designed it and uh, trained the Colectivo Women to apply it. The women from the Colectivo <coughs> were the ones who applied the interviews to other women with psychosocial disabilities, and this helped create an environment of trust that is key to the research between the researcher and, and the person being interviewed. 
Nosotros lo que queremos ya nos hemos fortalecido y capacitado sobre la Convención de Derechos de Personas con Discapacidad. Nos, nos gustaría capacitarnos sobre la CEDAW, que hubiera más grupos de mujeres como el Comité de Mujeres del Colectivo Chucán, que hubiera organizaciones y financiadoras que apoyaran a, a organizaciones independientes de personas con discapacidad psicosocial. También que So uh, what we want now is that we have uh, empowered each other and we have learned about our rights on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, but now we also want to learn more about the CDAO and to uh, strengthen the gender perspective in our work. We also want to uh, strengthen the committee and we want to reach out to more women with psychosocial disabilities. We also want more groups like ours, so we call on funders and also on other organizations to uh, help set up uh, groups like the Colectivo, the way DRI did, and uh, we also want to um, uh, women with psychosocial disabilities to stop being segregated. Las mujeres con discapacidad psicosocial hemos sido discriminadas, invisibilizadas, y por eso es muy importante que de verdad se trabaje en favor de que se garantice los derechos humanos de las mujeres con discapacidad psicosocial y que se respete a las mujeres en, en, en el artículo 12 de la Convención de Personas con Discapacidad de las Naciones Unidas, la toma de decisiones, lo que nos concierne a nuestra vida, a nuestro cuerpo, el artículo 19, a, a, a integrarnos a la comunidad independientemente y los demás derechos que señala la Convención de, de Personas con Discapacidad de las Naciones Unidas que, gar, que se garantice. Sería todo. Gracias. Uh, women with disabilities have been segregated, especially with psychosocial disabilities, have been segregated for a long time, many times in very abusive institutions. We, uh, we call on uh, governments to guarantee and respect the rights recognized on, in the CRPD. Uh, especially Article 19, right to, go, right to live in the community, and Article 12, right to make decisions over our lives and over our own bodies. Thank you. And Article 12. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And 15, no more torture. Thank yes. you. Um, regarding the research that Natalia mentioned, it's a very innovative research, first of all, because it involves women with disabilities in, uh, in the design, but also in the implementation. And also because it's, one, it's the first one in Mexico to address uh, the violations against the sexual and reproductive rights of women with disabilities, but also one of the few in the world. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, there, is, there is very little documentation on the frequency of violence against women. Uh, the, the results of our report are shocking. Uh, 40%, over 40% of the women that were interviewed had been sterilized in a forced or coerced manner. Over 40% have suffered uh, abuse, including sexual abuse and rape when visiting a gynecologist. Women with uh, psychosocial disabilities that are pregnant, even if it results from a consensual relationship, are pressured and offer forced into an abortion. And uh, with mo women with these psychosocial disabilities that decide to be mothers do not have the support that they need uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to carry on with their uh, childbearing responsibilities as uh, recognized by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. These results are even more shocking because the women that we interviewed live in the community and have access to outpatient services in the community in an independent manner. However, most women with psychosocial disabilities are segregated in the best case scenario in their homes or in the worst case scenario in very abusive institutions, which DRI, with uh, over 20 years of experience in more than 40 countries, has documented that um, are that uh, there uh, where this is where the worst uh, abuses to their sexual and reproductive rights occur, including forced removal of children. And we have we found an institution uh, that its policy is the forceful sterilization of every woman and girl that is admitted to the institution. We also found widespread sexual and physical abuse, and including and also even trafficking. Uh, this just shows that after uh, the, Be the Beijing conference, 
the rights of women with disabilities are not being guaranteed and actually the rights of women with, with psychosocial disabilities are being violated in a very grave manner. Uh, to show this, we, have, we are going to show a two-minute uh, video uh, that Al Jazeera made on uh, the report that the Colectivo and DRI has released. Denise Alvarez's schizophrenia doesn't stop her painting or wanting to lead a normal life. Last year, she decided to try for children with her boyfriend. At first, I felt good, excited. I thought the doctors would say I could have children, but they told me that I had to be sterilized so I didn't pass on my schizophrenia. I was devastated. 40% of mentally ill women surveyed in a new report from Disability Rights International said they'd been coerced or forced into sterilization by doctors or their families. When the government sterilizes women, what its, uh, its argument is that it's protecting them and the children they could have if they got pregnant. Uh, however, uh, the government is not protecting them, it's uh, violating the rights. Sterilization is not the solution. The Colectivo Chucan, an organization of people with psychiatric disorders who campaign for the rights of fellow sufferers, questioned over 50 women for the study. They found testimonies not just of sterilization, but also physical and sexual abuse. The group surveyed mainly independent women living within the community, but they fear that conditions could be far worse for the invisible population institutionalized within closed door psychiatric units like this one. In one institution, uh, we found that uh, every woman and girl that is admitted to it is forcefully sterilized. In our opinion, this is uh, to cover up the sexual abuse that goes on in the institution by preventing any pregnancy. Doctors and nurses who spoke with Al Jazeera on condition of anonymity confirmed the culture of sterilization. If the women are abandoned by the families long term in psychiatric institutions, then they are sterilized whether they agree to it or not. Doctors who justify sterilizations cite evidence that psychiatrically disabled mothers can pass on their illnesses to their children and are often unable to care for them. Berenice has so far refused to be pressured into sterilization. What does my life have to do with them? Why are the doctors getting involved in a decision that should be mine? If her condition worsens, she could have that choice taken away from her, like many other women with psychiatric problems in Mexico. John Holman, Al Jazeera, Mexico City. Thank you very much for sharing um, these great insights on how to empower women and ultimately also girls with psychosocial disabilities together with the Colectivo Chucan. And I just want to add also they're doing great work integrating the men with psychosocial disabilities in fighting together with the women for their rights in Mexico. So it's really an outstanding practice. And I would like to invite, uh, invite Mila Noy from Kenya to share with us about the work done on violence in Kenya. Hi everyone, my name is Milanoi. Is the arm that's going like that? That's yes. your problem. Stay away from it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Milanoi, I come from Kenya, and um, I got an opportunity to work with Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped, a disability rights organization. And how this happened is that they have been working, um, first of all, Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped is an organization for families and persons with intellectual disability. And as they did their work in different parts of Kenya, they realized that there was a rise in violence against women and girls with, dis with intellectual disabilities. There's a lot of sexual violence, and they didn't know what to do about this. They approached us as the Coalition on Violence Against Women to see what they, we can do together. Now that we are working on violence against women issues, and once they came to us, we decided to do a proposal together. A women's rights organization and a disability rights organization. And um, the project, we decided to start with a baseline survey where we went to like specific areas uh, where Kai works. And we did the baseline and spoke to women and girls with intellectual disabilities. We spoke to um, service, provider, service providers, police officers, and healthcare workers. We're able to speak even with the general community as well. And when we did the baseline survey, um, we actually confirmed and 
got data that the cases are actually happening. At first of all, it wasn't very easy to talk to the community persons and even persons with intellectual disability because not everyone was very comfortable talking about it. And when we spoke to like police officers and healthcare workers, most of them didn't know what even what intellectual disability is in the first place. And that was our first point of contact. From the baseline survey, um, around 54.9% of women and girls that we spoke to have been violated more than once. Yeah? And the number keeps increasing every day. And in Kenya, there's no much of institutionalization, but at the community level, there's a lot of isolation, segregation, and therefore they're not really a part of the community as well. Um, after the results of the baseline, um, we decided to have specific um, activities to see how we can handle with the specific issues we had. First of all, there was the need to empower the service providers, police officers and healthcare workers, who will be the first point of contact with persons with disability once they go to the healthcare center or to the police station to seek for assistance. And um, I remember in the baseline, I have to say, I spoke to one probation officer to just find out like, if she's, she's ever handled any case. It was really sad to see that as a probation officer, she told me she handled one case of a lady who had a psychosocial disability. And when she was told to write her statement as a probation officer, she went to the community, spoke to the boys. It was a group of three boys who had uh, sexually violated her. And she spoke to the parents and a couple of neighbors. And her report to the judge um, was that the boys are actually very well behaved and sh they should have an um, out of court sentence, just a probation or something like that. Uh, and she actually told me that she felt that maybe this girl has been violated more than once. So why should these boys go for, to jail for something they've been found doing and maybe it's happened more than once? To me, this was really sad. It was the reality that even a probation officer, someone who's supposed to be there to help, you know, a survivor, is the one who's making the situation worse. And luckily for that case, the boys were sentenced to 15 years imprisonment, but she was really mad about it. She was like, I think this is very unfair and stuff like that. This just shows how bad it is. And we therefore uh, decided to approach like persons like her, you know? They need to be trained to understand persons with disabilities. They need to understand the different kinds of persons with disability. And I even asked her, why would you go to the, to the mother's boy to find out about them? As a probation officer, if you come, even though you come to me and I have a son, of course I'll tell you my son is a good boy, you know? Um, and even the women I, we spoke to in the community, they said they, they didn't even believe in the system. Why are there not many reported cases in the police station? They say they don't trust the police officers. If you go to a police officer, they always feel like they don't have enough evidence. And they're scared of actually um, using uh, persons with disability as witnesses in court. They don't think they, they have like a really strong case. And uh, from there, we decided to work with Kai, where, um, as the coalition, we'll bring in the legal expertise. We'll provide legal aid and free legal services to survivors. And in our trainings with service providers, police officers and healthcare workers, we train them on, okay, we train them on what needs to be done. How, how do you handle a case in court? How do you maintain the chain of evidence to ensure that there's no evidence lost? And Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped brought in a very, very vital component, how to understand persons with intellectual disability. They are able to explain what is an intellectual disability, the different kinds of disabilities, and how a police officer needs to handle them. That was really surprising to them because they didn't even know how to handle them, you know? Most of them still use derogatory terms, you know, that, like even in the police station, they were very open and they said they have terms that they call them, you know? They use words like uh, mongolos, words that are still very commonly used, and it was really sad to note that. And, um, you know, we also were able to talk to like community members, and many community members said that they know someone with an intellectual disability in the community. And they've seen cases of violations happening. But um, another thing was that most cases never went to court. One, families never believed in the justice system. There's a lot of backlog of cases. Criminal cases take so long. Then again, most of them have to go to work. Appearing in court more than 10 times, they feel is a waste of time. They'll have been making money somewhere else. Then again, most of the perpetrators are close family members or neighbors. And there's the fear of taking a neighbor or a family member to court. Therefore, like some of the family members settled the matters out of court. 
That was the saddest reality. Like 90% of the cases, they've been settled at the, com at the family level. And if it's a neighbor, they'd use that to their advantage and give the parents money. Like, if you don't take me to court, I'll give you something small, you know? Um, from there on, um, we decided to try and work with the community members and raise awareness where if a community member knows something has happened, they also have a duty to report, you know? Because most of them would keep silent. They'd say, yeah, I know. There's a family where someone has been defiled. She even maybe has a child, but um, nothing has ever been done. And this project was very helpful because healthcare workers were able to learn about dis the different forms of disabilities. And the cases we took up, after like many people re talk, heard about the project, we got calls from all over Kenya. I will not lie to you, we were overwhelmed with cases. And we started trying to work with our pro bono advocates who asked, um, said that they also would love to take up cases, but they needed as well training to understand disability rights, you know? What are the different kinds of disabilities? How do I handle a client who comes to my office? And this project just shows how the importance of a women's rights organization and a disability rights organization can come together as one, put your strengths together, and help, you know? Uh, having voices together makes it better and stronger. And I'd encourage like most women's rights organizations to include women and girls in, with disabilities in all their programs. We get funding to work on women and girls' rights, right? That, it, doesn't, it, does not include, it does not exclude women and girls with disabilities. It should be automatic. Let's include everyone. And at the same time, disability rights organizations should reach out, you know? They should reach out to women's rights organizations and work together. In all forums, I have been in forums at the local, national, and international level, but even in women's meetings, you never see women with disabilities represented or even issues raised about them. It's, it's, it's a high time we all come together as one. And for even disability rights organization, let's come to these meetings. Women's rights meetings should involve everyone, you know? And advocate for it, go for it at the local level, national level, and at the international level. And, okay, I hear my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome now Young Shmuli from the UN Women, the disability, disability focal person, maybe to let us all know what is UN Women going to do to bring women with disabilities more systematically into the work around women in this world. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm from UN Yumin, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of this important discussion. And I would like to start my comment by reminding you of one uh, statistic. A bit louder. Yes. Yeah, I would like to start my comment uh, by reminding you of one statistic. Women's disability prevalence ratio of 19.2% is much higher than men's ratio of 12%. This means that almost one out of five women is suffering from disabilities throughout their lifespan. And also this means uh, women's uh, low economic and social status, women's uh, violence against women, and the harmful gender discriminatory practices. Women are more likely to experience disabilities than men. This is the reason why women with disabilities should be taken more seriously by the women's rights movement as well as the disability rights movement. Uh, to address the intersection of gender and dis disability, UN Women has advocated a gender mainstreaming, disability inclusive ap approach, as coined by Roshida Manjo, special reporter on violence against women. We are trying to mainstream disability into the gender work and vice versa. Uh, to this end, UN Women is actively engaged in the UN system's systematic efforts to promote disability inclusive development. As a member of the Interagency Support Group to the CRPD Convention, UN Women has recently joined 
the UN partnership to promote the rights of persons with disabilities, which is UNPRPD. And our offices can now apply for funds with a, a, a suitable projects. Uh, women, women has also given special consideration to women, with, women and girls with disabilities in a number of UN women's programs, including, including those in Egypt, Moldova, China, and Tajikistan. And the voices of women with disabilities are steadily accommodated into UN women's work. For example, the UN Women Eastern and Southern African Civil Society Advisory Group is now headed by a woman with disabilities. Of course, uh, uh, this is not enough, and we know that, and we will make uh, further efforts. Uh, but, however, I believe member states hold the key to the elimination of violence against women and girls with disabilities. And the best way to attract their attention to this issue is taking advantage of the international conventions and the treaty monitoring process. We know that the CRPD and the CEDAW conventions are two most relevant ones, and each of them has several articles and general recommendations regarding the rights of women with disabilities. However, if you look at the state parties' reports to these two conventions, you can easily notice that many of the reports have very limited information. Uh, I, yeah, I have also looked uh, through around 30 state parties' reports to the CRPD convention, and only seven out of 30 countries included information about violence against women. And the statistics on violence against uh, women with disabilities uh, were not available in any report. And in the case of the Beijing Plus 20 reports, I found only two reports mentioned statistics on violence against women with disabilities. Those uh, countries are Iceland and Germany. So, so I think monitoring is uh, uh, very important. And in this regard, I'd like to make two recommendations. First is, uh, we should encourage and help member states to provide better information on women with disabilities in their reports. Uh, and I would like to commend the CRPD co uh, report of India, uh, which contains uh, extensive information on women with disabilities, and uh, this is the one. And this was done with the help of uh, women leaders with disabilities in India, and uh, I know one, uh, our colleague, Dr. Asha Hans, uh, are here, is here. And uh, the second uh, recommendation is a systematic monitoring should be in place. Member states and the territory monitoring bodies will be more responsive if they know their work is to be monitored and uh, watched. So women DPOs are encouraged to prepare the shadow or alternative, alternative reports. And uh, I would like to introduce one uh, best practice. Last year, Women Enabled International, which is headed by our colleague Stephanie here, uh, submitted a shadow report to the Human Rights Council for Youth in its review of the United States. So I think this can be shared by many colleagues. Of course, to deal with these challenges more effectively, we should strengthen the organizational capacity of women DPOs, and they should get together to make their voice bigger and stronger. Women leaders or champions with disabilities should be identified and further empowered both domestically and globally. I would like to close my comment by sharing one uh, dis uh, disturbing information. Uh, the CRPD committee is composed of uh, 18 members, and out of them, six are women. So the women's ratio is 30 percent. Of course, this is not enough. But last year, June, during the state parties conference to the CRPD convention, nine members of the CRPD committee were elected or re-elected. Do you know how many of women were included? Only one out of nine. So, and the next year, June, there will be another election, and the current five female members are to go through the election. How, 
how many women do you expect to be included? Hopefully, we could be better prepared for the best results, as well as the enhanced visibility of women with disabilities in all levels of national and global decision making. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just sum up and then open up for questions. Um, I do want to refer to this data that now has been presented from UN Women and our review of the country reports that Illinois and wonderful students from Syracuse University helped with, um, with Stephanie Ordaleva at Women Enabled International. I think that one thing that we're identifying is the need for more data. It's clear. But the title of our report is, Where Are Girls and Women with Disabilities? And I want to answer that right now and today. We're here. We're there and we're everywhere. And I think that we're excited that this forum can be the beginning of more sustained efforts to include women with disabilities in all of the women's rights community actions on the global, national, and local level. You've heard about just a couple of the wonderful initiatives that are happening on the local level in Mexico and in Kenya. But through Handicap International and our Making It Work initiative, We've had an opportunity to review over 50 projects that are happening in the world to benefit and to, to benefit women with disabilities, but to eliminate violence against women and girls with disabilities. Of those 50 or so, we have visited so far now nine, and we've prepared information on those projects and are happy to disseminate them to you. But in order to do that, you have to sign up a sign-up sheet that's going around, so we'll get your emails, and we'll be happy to provide you with the growing data, resources, and information that we now have, particularly around the issue of violence against girls and women with disabilities. OK. Um, I have a couple more things I'll say, but I'd like to stop, because you've heard a lot from us, and to ask if there are any questions that you may have that we can direct to the speakers. I'll take two or three questions at a time, um, repeat them here so everyone can hear, and just let me know which of our speakers you'd like to answer for you. Any questions? Yes, Netta. Uh, maybe I have a, a comment and also um, a very short question. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers for very insightful um, you know, presentations and talks. I would like to thank the organizers uh, for just offering this space for deep learning, very meaningful learning as well. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I was so happy to hear uh, the word uh, intersectionality mentioned several times in today's uh, discussions. Uh, you know, this is a theory and a policy tool and a methodology as well, based on the understanding that gender is not the only factor that shapes women's experiences, and that other factors such as physical um, ability, um, race, uh, and other factors of identity actually contribute to shaping women's uh, experiences of, um, um, you know, oppression, subordination, and also resistance. And I think this is very important. Um, I was so happy to hear about a number of, um, you know, cases of. Um, uh, good practice models, uh, including the experience from Kenya, our sisters from Kobao, I would like to comment um, your uh, work. Uh, but I think that also, uh, and I think that there is a need for even wider, um, you know, coalition building, including with, um, you know, groups that work on issues around racial uh, discrimination, um, on the experiences of women um, with disabilities who live in more affected areas, um, and other women, you know, I mean, women with other, um, uh, who are experiencing other forms of discrimination, for example, based on other aspects of identity. Um, how is that possible? And then I know also, uh, you know, from the experiences of women's organizations from the past, I remember at uh, Huayo during the Beijing conference, there was um, a, a session uh, organized to discuss the rights of women with disabilities that was not accessible, and women were pro protesting in front of that hall. So I think things have changed uh, since Beijing uh, to the better, but uh, it's always challenging to form these kinds of coalitions. Um, you know, how uh, are we able to overcome these kinds of challenges? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions? Try to keep some questions. Other questions? Yes, front row. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm a camp counselor, actually, for kids with um, developmental disabilities for boy camp. Um, and so one of the things that I learned in my training was how in the media, whenever there are perceptions of people with disabilities, and they're rare, but whenever there are, they're exceptionalized and viewed as 
you know, they're somehow really incredible just because they get up in the morning and live a life. Um, and it doesn't really value the person, it just values the fact that they're willing to live with a disability, but it's not like there's another option. So I just want to know what can be done to change that, um, or what anyone thinks can be done to change that perspective of the way that, um, and just the image of, uh, in the media that we see of women and girls with disabilities and just people with disabilities in general as somehow being an exception and not the norm. Thank you. Let's take one more question. Yes, in the back. Yes. Yes. Great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Shantha. I'm uh, the Director of Disability Rights at Human Rights Watch. So I, I really enjoyed the panel. Thanks to Arlene and Syracuse and to Ulrika and Handicap International. And a special thank, and of course Stephanie and Women Enable, but a special thanks to our friends from Kenya and Mexico. It was really interesting uh, to hear your perspectives and the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention that we've done a report on India on women with disabilities that came out in December. I think there were some copies in the back. But a lot of the findings are very similar, particularly women with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities who are locked in institutions and face a whole range of abuses. Sorry if I'm speaking too fast with the sign language interpretation. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to be quick. Um, and what we've just recently uh, published last week was a document on gender-based violence in what's called easy to read format, which I think was circulated, which I hope will be useful for you in Kenya, just explaining what is violence, what's good touch, bad touch, how can you get help if you are a woman or a girl with an intellectual disability who's a victim of violence. Um, my question goes to you know, the point that you raised in Ke uh, from Kenya, but also it goes targeted to Mexico, uh, to both of you, about mainstreaming within women's rights movement. So I think you are a great example of how this issue has been mainstreamed, and I think it's been a real challenge to get women's rights organizations to pay attention to this population. So if you could share perhaps how you were successful and if other organ women's organizations beyond yours are actually engaging with this population who are otherwise mostly marginalized, and if maybe you can tell us in Mexico if women's organizations were receptive to your research and whether they collaborated and supported it and what strategies you've developed for long, you know, longer term advocacy because again, you know, women with disabilities are part of the, should be part of the women's movement and I'm curious to see how you were successful in doing that. Thank you. And one more question and then we'll take three and then we'll go, do you want to do the brown shirt? Me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, as long as we're able to disable women's network in Canada, which is actually the share another um, idea with uh, everybody who's here, which is that we did a project. Speak up, because I think I won't be able to repeat it. We did a project with Western University Center for Violence and, and Prevention for Women and Families. And it was a project that allowed us to work with gender studies, a component of academic uh, research in Canada. And so one of the things we developed was to learn some learning briefs that are available including a, a learning brief to share with gender studies programs that discusses ableism as a form of violence against women. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just share that that is, a, I think, a high-level takeaway for all of us is that you need to name ableism as a form of violence against women. Thank you. Okay, let me just get some responses. I don't know, Stephanie, if you want to respond on the issue of media, and then if Natalie and... Um, and Priscilla and, no, and Milanoi can respond about how to mainstream issues. So, Stephanie? And then we'll come back for one more round of questions. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you for raising the points about uh, women in the media and women with disabilities in the media. Uh, there's a wonderful woman, Harolyn Russo, who actually lives here in New York, who has just written a book entitled Don't Call Me Inspirational. <laughs> and um, it's a great book, and I really recommend it. It's very, um, it's funny as well as sobering. And she, she, has, a, she has a great self-introspection about um, uh, being a woman with a disability. I did just want to say one thing in uh, response to all the comments about uh, India, is that you know when we looked at the country report of India in our review of the Beijing Plus 20 reports, unfortunately the, uh, the, Be the country report never really talked about violence against women and the high level of violence against women and girls, well, it talked about violence against women, but it didn't talk about the high level of violence against women and girls with disabilities, especially in rural communities and in institutions. Um, with respect to the media thing of how we kind of get our voices out there, I, I think doing things like what DRI has done with a really active media campaign, um, it's very difficult to get uh, 
journalists to cover our issues. I tweet at them all the time, um, you know, directly, uh, when we have something to report about our work or some of the work of our colleagues. Um, I also think that when women um, with disabilities are in the media, we need, to, we need to support them and get very, very engaged on their work so that we can uh, promote our sisters with disabilities. On mainstreaming, the first thing I'd say is that um, what we did, first of all, is I realized that we have very many programs as a women's rights organization. And if our work is on violence against women, we have a team on sexual and reproductive health. I was working on access to justice. So we mainstreamed all the other programs, like sexual and reproductive health, started including, we did a training for all staff as well to, um, to learn about disability rights. Therefore, in all our activism, we included disability rights automatically. In the team on community activism, sexual and reproductive health rights, access to justice, we did everything. We included um, disability in all our programs as well, just because of the realization. And another thing is, sometimes, even in women's rights organizations, it, it's, it's done subconsciously. Before I did the baseline with Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped, I never thought of it like that, you know? I was like, we always say we are women's rights activists, but I was embarrassed to call myself one after I did the baseline. I was like, if we don't reach out to women and girls with disabilities, then clearly we are not. And it's all about um, women's rights organizations consciously realizing and including women and girls with disabilities. That would be the best way to mainstream in all their programs because the grants are already for women and girls. So you don't have to do anything new. Just include them in the programs. It is a real challenge. We found in Mexico and also through our work in Guatemala uh, that it's a real challenge to get uh, women's organizations interested and involved in disability issues. For the release of our report, we contacted personally women's organizations uh, uh, and they were interested, which is the first step. Then the next step is to get them involved. And uh, another... Um, uh, so uh, through our research when uh, we're back in Mexico, we just released this report, uh, is uh, to, to keep the, in contact with uh, the women's organizations that have expressed interest. And uh, like Milanoi said, organize, uh, find out common interests and from there build on uh, projects and also sensitize them to the women's issues. Uh, another very important uh, Role, another very important thing that needs to be highlighted is that disability rights organizations also need to take on a very clear gender perspective, which uh, so far uh, it's still a challenge, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me get some questions. So th there were other questions in the back. Way back, there's one, Susan Seagal. Is that a Susan Seagal seat there? Yes, and there are other questions. There was something else in the back? Yes, and here to the left. Okay, so these two and three. Okay, so that's all we have time for, and we'll continue our discussion. Susan Seagal, yes, hello? Yes, I have my two sisters here from the Namibia and Fiji to follow. This is Susan Seagal from Mobility International USA. And we have a program called WILD, which has now got 200 women with disability leaders and over 80 Just interrupt. Can everyone up here hear? Because no, I can talk real loud. I know you can. So, <laughs> so we, we have a, we've been working with, with WILD, which consists now of 200 women with disability from over 80 countries who are all disability women activists cross disability. And we've developed um, a curriculum that includes uh, violence against women and also how to work with women's and other human rights organizations. We're field testing the curriculum in different countries. We have a train the trainer program this summer, but we will have this curriculum available for everybody and it will be in English and Spanish and hopefully in some other languages. So we just wanted to let you know that that is going as well as a photo exhibit celebrating the disabled women activists representing 50 countries and 50 disabled women. So I'll be in the back and thank you for the panel and for, every, and for everything you're doing. My sister from Namibia and Fiji. Um, I, I would just like to thank the panel, first of all, for the good presentation that they have given us. Uh, it was really an insight and an eye-opening. Uh, 
Let me answer that quickly and then we'll go on to the last two questions. Mental illness is a very medicalized term, okay? We've moved beyond that to recognize that someone is disabled not because of their particular diagnosis by some doctor, but by, by the environment around them that prevents them from equally participating. Psychosocial is a term that's been used out for a while, recognizing that person's psychiatric state is not the relevant issue. It's their interaction with their social environment. So psychosocial is a term that's been used when we drafted the CRPD. It's used now to recognize without labeling and stigmatizing an individual because of what's considered deficit rather than the stigma and the prejudice of society. That's why we use psychosocial as the Mental term. Mental illness is Nazi propaganda for God's sakes. Read your history. Okay. Um, we had another question here. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I commend the presenters for your great initiative, and you've given me the courage to share um, as fast as I can what's happening in the Pacific in terms of um, addressing the issue of violence against women and girls with disabilities. I'm actually a part of my delegation. My name is Fatino Tumapu, but I'm representing the Samoa disability sector. So from where I'm from, we have the families, we have the Family Safety Act, the Violence Act, and the uh, Family Code. These provide um, pr women and girls with disabilities opportunity to to lodge their complaints and also to access to legal protections where possible. From the Pacific, we have concrete evidence of um, researchers which provide us with um, concrete evidence of the violence and abuse that our women and girls with disabilities are experiencing, such as the Pacific Sisters with Disabilities and uh, um, Deeper Silence Report. One of the messages we're trying to get across is to ensure that all violence-free initiatives are inclusive, responsive to the diverse needs of persons with disabilities, and also women, women and girls with disabilities have to be included right from the beginning and uh, implementation as so well as the uh, monitoring and reporting of all um, violence-free initiatives. In saying that, let us work together and use this as an opportunity to, to work together and to ensure that issues of women and to create a, a world that is um, inclusive, responsive, and, vi and virus-free for, for all women and girls with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. I'm Abhya Akram from Pakistan. I will just briefly thank you very much for your wonderful presentations and the comment. Uh, just a quick comment, like when we talk about the gender-based violence within the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the CEDAW, the biggest challenge we have found out in last two decades, like these are the languages are so complicated for youth with disabilities to understand. So how we can make it in an easy language so everybody can share their experiences and both the trainings of the gender organizations on disability and the trainings of disability organizations on gender perspective. So this link needs to be created in different organizations and also we need to document. So I think Harika Vijayadasi have done a good thing because all the work is going on the ground, but there is no link between the government and the UN agencies. So we need to create that best link to show that best practices in each of the countries. So then we could make a better change in the policies, in the legislation, and we can get more visibility of women with disabilities at all levels. I 
teach in law school. We begin our classes on time. We end our classes on time. So it's now 2 o'clock, and I have to end this session. I'm sorry, we can continue our conversations um, either here in the hall, but I just want to thank you all sincerely for coming, for opening up your hearts and your minds, I hope, and that you will join us as this will be the first stage, as we hope, in continuing efforts. Before we go, one more thing. Stephanie, did you want to say a final word? Or just a quick word. A quick word from Stephanie Ordeleva, who's leading us in this effort. Yes, um, I just wanted to um, reiterate, because some of you may not have heard me before, uh, we are also continuing to review these country reports, and if people are interested, especially people from the countries, are interested in helping us to review the country reports from their country, to please come and, um, and see me and let me know if you're so interested. It really doesn't take a long time but the thing that would be most valuable about having some of you join us in these reviews is you know your country um, far better than someone who doesn't live there and hasn't worked there. So I also would just suggest to the woman who, from my colleague, a sister from Pakistan, I think Shanta's uh, book that she's prepared on uh, sexual violence and gender-based violence in a sort of a plainer language might be of some use to you. I don't know if it's in Arabic or any other languages yet beyond English, but it might be of just a starting point to help with that work that you're doing, the wonderful work that you're doing in Pakistan. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have fun at CSW. There are copies if people need. There should be copies around. There are more.